Okay, now if we come to a power system, uh, a normal power system, then we have the energy generation, transmission, distribution, and the LV level distribution, that is LV systems and equipment. So when we come to the lightning protection, we consider the, the protection of energy generation systems separately, the protection of transmission or HV system separately, then distribution system separately, and then the LV systems. So today I'm going to touch a little bit about the transmission systems and distribution systems. Now, what are the basic differences in lightning effects on HV, ME systems and LV systems? I'm not talking about the protection scenario, I'm talking about the lightning effects. So the first difference is that uh, the transmission and distribution lines are much more exposed to lightning strikes than LB lines, which are usually stretched in built-in environment because usually you know that the LV lines are in cities and, and in habit habitations, so that uh, it is in built-in environments, whereas in the case of transmission lines, they stretch tens or hundreds of kilometers in exposed area. And the second one is the amplitude of the induced or generated voltages in LV systems are much more significant than in HVMV systems. Let's see with a small diagram later. So the when lightning strike either LV system or MV or HV system, uh, the induced or generated voltage may be the same, but the significant is much higher in LV systems than HVMV systems. And also, number three, where the voltage occurs in the nominal waveform and its polarity uh, uh, is also very significant in HV systems, HV or MV systems, compared to the LV systems. So this is what I'm telling. Now imagine that on the left-hand side, you have an LV system, and on the right-hand side, an HVMV system. So imagine that there is a certain lightning uh, strikes the LV system, giving rise to a certain voltage, and now you will see that in the LV system, compared to the nominal voltage, the, the transient voltage is quite high, quite high. And also, uh, whether it happens at the positive side or negative side, the, the transmission is, uh, the, the transient is positive or negative, it, it doesn't matter much. But you can see that in the case of HV and MV, MV systems, depending on the time of occurrence in the nominal voltage, the effect of lightning transient is different. Sometimes it may not be even felt. And the fourth difference is reflection at impedance mismatch points. So for an example, an earth termination plays a much significant role in HVMV lines. Why? Because the, the distance, the, the length of lines is very high, so that the reflection effects are also coming into play. And also in the case of HV and MV systems, the insulators play a significant role compared to the LV systems. Okay, now this diagram shows you uh, what we are dealing with. 
if we come to transients, the, the fastest transients are usually nuclear high altitude electromagnetic pulses, which we call NEMS and HEMS in shortened form, of which the duration or rise time is in the order of nanoseconds. Then comes the lightning impulses. You can see that the in the NEMS and HEMS, the amplitude can be extremely high, but the duration is small. So in lightning, the duration goes to microsecond scale, but uh, the amplitude is now less than that of NEMS and HEMS. Then come the switching impulses when you on and off a load uh, in a grid. Uh, so you get switching impulses. There are various reasons for switching impulses. They can extend up to milliseconds. Then comes a very important uh, uh, noise or in, important anomaly, which is TOVs, temporary over voltages, which can go into seconds and then the system voltage. And today our story uh, is at the transient voltage, although even NEMS and HEMS are transient voltage, usually in electrical engineering, when we say transient over voltages, people are talking about lightning and switching impulses. And now, uh, if I go into the transient over voltages, the, the lightning and switching impulses, there are basically three types we talk about, the slow front, the, the slow front over voltage, SFO, FFO, and VFFO. So uh, most often we are trying to give solution to all three types together, but uh, with the, the most of the general lightning protection devices, F VFFOs may not be able to cope up with. And uh, sorry about this, uh, there is something wrong with the, the text, but it is not that important. And uh, this table will show you the durations of various uh, no noises. The, the transients, the slow front, fast front, and very fast fronts. And they have their own ways of representing in the test standards. And this table will give you uh, the, the causes of uh, transients. And you can see that it's not one cause, it's not only lightning which is responsible for the transients. There are various power line operations that also gives rise to the transients. Okay, then lightning issues in HVME systems. Basically, uh, in the case of high voltage and medium voltage systems, we say that the issues are at transmission and distribution lines. In other words, the, the, the problem comes in the line uh, rather than uh, uh, at any other place uh, where the, the most probable uh, place of uh, the lightning strike. And also the problem comes in switchyards and substations where you have transformers and controlling devices. So first we'll look at what really the problem in uh, transmission and distribution lines. Let me show you with a, a very simple uh, animation. Look at it. I hope that you got the idea. Now consider that uh, the, there is a transmission line. For the simplicity, I took only two towers. This extends all the way. If lightning strikes uh, one of the towers, then bulk of the current will be grounded through the uh, earthing 
system of that tower. And uh, if the tower has a high uh, resistance, TFR is for tower footing resistance. So if there is a high tower footing resistance, then what happens is that there will be a large voltage developed with respect to the earth along the tower so that a significant amount of current will go through the shielding wire that that uh, the wire at the top is the shielding wire and then uh, you get uh, the current uh, diverted into the earthing system of the uh, the the other tower so it happens in the other side as well the, the, there will be several towers where the lightning current is distributed so that greater the potential along the tower more current diverts to other towers now imagine that if tfr is very high now imagine that the tfr is very very high something in the order of several hundred ohms. Now what would be the case? Now, apart from the current diverted through the shielding wire, there is a possibility the, the tower, now we call that the tower is very hot because due to the very large tower footing resistance, the whole tower is now raised to a very high voltage so that there will be a flashover at the insulators at one of the, I just took the middle arm, uh, the, the flashover happens and then the current will go into the phase wires. I, I'm showing you only one side, it can happen in all sides and then the current may most probably a part of the current can go into the transformer or switch yard and get grounded through the transformer sometimes uh, giving rise to serious trouble. And this tower to the face wire arcing is called the back flashover. Now imagine that if a lightning attaches with a face wire due to the bypassing or absence of shield wire. Imagine that there is a shielding wire, but still there will be a bypassing of the shielding wire and the lightning get attached to the face wire. Later on, we will see uh, how that can happen. Or imagine that there is no shielding wire. Now the face wire get the lightning. So the result would be uh, there will be a, a high potential at the point of strike and therefore you will get a flashover through the insulator into the tower and get grounded. And here also, there is a chance that uh, the lightning current flows in all directions. And uh, this is one way of the lightning current flows, the other side of the phase wire. Apart from that, there can be a part going through the, the, the shielding wire also in all directions. And uh, here we call it a flashover because we the flashing or arcing happens from phase wire to the tower. Now flashover usually occurs at a tower where the TFR is the lowest. This is an interesting point. Back flashover usually happens at a tower or when the tower resistance, tower footing resistance is very high. But on the other hand, the, the flashover happens usually at the tower which has the best earth resistance. 
And uh, this diagram shows you, or this slide shows you, uh, a, a very a simple uh, calculation. I'm not uh, going into many calculations, few equations you will come across during this presentation. But here you will see that, imagine that there are two, two towers uh, and in the middle or somewhere in the middle, the lightning strikes a wire. It may be the shielding wire, it can be a phase wire. Now, if the lightning has a peak current of about 40 kiloamperes, then 20 kiloamperes will flow in one direction, 20 kiloamperes will flow in other direction. That's a, a very fair assumption to make. If the maximum current derivative of the injected current is 40 kiloamperes per microsecond, again, some sort of a mean value for a negative subsequent stroke, then if we just apply V equals LDI by DT, because when you take a wire and a transient current, you will find that the VR term, the, the resistive component of the voltage is extremely low. So that uh, if L is the inductance per unit length, then L into X is the total inductance. That into dy by dt will give you the voltage, which is in the order of uh, the V1 is in the order of uh, 30 kilovolts. Then, in the case of the tower, uh, say that the, the tower footing has a resistance of 5 ohms and the tower inductance is about 10 microhenries, then uh, dy by dt. Uh, we just if we consider uh, 20 kiloamps per microsecond, then uh, we get uh, V2 equals Ri plus LDI by dt. Now you don't forget that uh, the earth resistance of the tower plays a role and you get something like 300 kilovolts. So you have to add the two, so it's about 330 kilovolts at uh, the point of strike with respect to a uh, distant ground. So the voltage that you will get is in that order, typically 300, 400 kilovolts the maximum. Now in addition to falls discussed, you can also get phase to phase and phase to phase to earth falls. What does that mean? Sometimes arcing can happen from face to face through air. Or sometimes when lightning strike uh, uh, the topmost or upper conductor, there can be sequence of arcing from one line to the line below that, from that to the line below that, and then to the earth. Then in switcher, substations, etc., et usually the earthing arrangements are much better than uh, in towers. Uh, so that therefore in the event of shielding failure or backlash over, the chances of a significant part of lightning current reaching switcher equipment and transformers is high. So uh, don't forget that. Uh, there are two things we are talking here, shielding failure and flashover. Flashover, back flashover, then shielding failure. These are two things. Shielding failure means the, the lightning step leader bypasses the, uh, the shielding wire and get attached to a phase wire. Flashover or back flashover is an arcing across a, a transformer coil or an insulator. All shielding failures may not give rise to such flashovers. Okay. And then uh, shielding wire, uh, the prevention of lightning damage. How can we prevent lightning damage to ME and HV lines? There are basically three concerns. Shielding wire, 
surge protection, then earthing and bonding. However, this is one very important thing. If you're working for an electrical company, then keep in mind that before you put your money into lightning protection, make sure that the uh, the lightning protect the, the the electrical system is properly maintained. What do you mean by properly maintained? There should be correct selection of insulator lens. So I'm not going to cover that part today uh, because it is not uh, comes under lightning protection. The in the in order to prevent the nominal frequency or a sustained over voltage arcing, there should be sufficient length of optimum length of insulators. Then reliability of insulators. Maybe sometimes you have an insulator uh, which is well calculated uh, for the optimum value to prevent uh, arcing. But with time, because of uh, the various reasons like high pollution, uh, dry bands, wet bands, and so on, the insulator characteristics can be changed. Therefore, you should monitor the insulator conditions very carefully. The reliability of low frequency fault interruption devices, that's another thing. Uh, before you go to lightning protection, you have to be very uh, thorough with the reliability of the fault interruption devices. Then maintenance of power line corridor. So what you see in the uh, picture, the photograph to the right hand side is the, we call the power line corridor or way of access as in some countries it is called. Uh, that should be maintained properly. Then protection of substations and switchers from natural disasters and man-made disasters. So this is another big problem. Now, if there are any uh, participants today from Pakistan, you know that in Karachi, very frequently you get a lot of problems due to flooding and substations get drowned in water which gives huge problems. Sometimes six, seven people get killed just due to the step potential. So these things should be paid very careful attention because some people think that lightning protection is the culprit when they have so many other uh, problematic uh, environments in the power system. And now, when we talk about MV and HV line protection, there are two important parameters uh, we got to know. I'm sure that if you're high voltage engineers, then you know this very well, the BIL and CFO. BIL is uh, the 90% probability of withstanding the, uh, an impulse. Uh, by an insulator and most of the insulation materials are talked in terms of bill but actually in when it comes to the lightning protection and the insulator performance we use CFO critical impulse flash over voltage more than the BIR that is the 50% probability of an insulator get surface arcing when you apply a certain voltage impulse. Now say for an example, we have an insulator. When we apply the lightning impulse, in lightning impulse is usually given by uh, uh, 1.2 1 50 microsecond uh, waveform. And imagine that when you apply 20 kilo volts uh, or, or, or say 200 kilo volts uh, applied 50 times and 
roughly 25 times you get the breakdown. So for that insulator, we say the CFO is uh, 200 kilovolts. Then we come to an important uh, uh, point called the flash collection rate of a distribution line. Uh, I'm sure that all of you know what is meant by the ground flash density. That is uh, number of flashes per square kilometer per year. So uh, the old type of giving the lightning ground flash density is isochronic level, which is now obsolete. So that uh, number of lightning striking a square kilometer area in within one year is the usual parameter given now. So, so if it if the country is having low ground flash density or NG, this value will be in the order of uh, say two, three, four uh, flashes per square kilometer per year. If it is around seven, eight. A six, seven, eight, in, then it is medium. If it goes to like 10, 12, 13, then we say it is quite high, uh, high value. Sorry. And uh, then when it comes to the transmission or distribution lines, number of flashes that interact with the line is given by another parameter called flashes per 100 kilometer per year because now there is no point of talking about the square kilometer because it's a line so we say that if you take 100 kilometers of the line what would be the the number of flashes that this uh, uh, line will collect in uh, one year period. So the relationship between that the available data of down flash density NG and the number of flashes per 100 kilometers per year is given by this equation where H is the height of the uppermost conductor at the pole. Usually this is applied in the distribution lines. In the transmission lines the equation changes a little bit and B is the width of the structure. But we have to do a small correction to this because sometimes the, uh, the close by, especially in the case of medium voltage lines, the close by objects, say trees, buildings and so on, or even parallel lines, make, make a change may make a difference in the number of flashes collected so that uh, we introduce uh, another uh, new factor called the environmental shielding factor which goes from zero to one uh, if it is zero that means no shielding at all so that ns becomes n uh, which we calculated earlier if, if it is surrounded very closely by very large tall buildings, which is not the case usually, then SF goes to one, then you can see that NS becomes zero. So NS is the number of flashes collected by the sheltered line in flashes per 100 kilometers per year. So the, the diagram into your right hand side shows the shielding factor, uh, on the uh, y-axis and the distance of object from the distribution line on the x-axis. What you can see is that if you take any line, you, can, you, will, you will see the shielding factor reduces, actually generally it reduces when the distance from the shielding object, like say for an example, a tall tree and the transmission line is large, that is uh, absolutely what we would expect. And also you can see that uh, if the, uh, the height of the shielding object increases, 
then the shielding factor is also increasing. Yeah, that's also very obvious. Then we are going to the uh, first one, the, uh, the shielding wire, the first scenario of lightning protection. Shielding wire is supposed to intercept with the lightning step leader before uh, the face wire will uh, interact with that. So flash over rate from direct flashes on unprotected phases in MV lines. Both corona and imperfect soil effects play relatively minor roles in the surge impedance of phase conductor, leading to changes of less than 30 in this value. Actually, now the thing is that the medium voltage lines compared to the transmission lines are rather small in size or, or uh, less in height. Therefore, the space charge and soil uh, resistivity does not play a much bigger role because if the lightning decides to hit the MV line, that means it has come quite low so that it will come irrespective of those factors. And then we come across a very important factor. Unless the distribution line insulation is protected with the overhead grounding wire or arresters, arresters means lightning arresters or surge protectors, more than 99% of all direct lightning flashes will cause distribution line flashovers regardless of the insulation level conductor spacing or grounding. What does that mean? If a distribution line get a direct strike in the absence of, because when it is, when there is an absence of an overhead grounding wire or surge arrester, there is no way that the lightning is controlled. Therefore, the, uh, the, all the lightning that come towards that line will be in the ending up at a phase wire so that these lightning, 99% of these lightning will cause flashover. Therefore, to estimate the number of flashovers due to direct lightning flashes, use the equations in the previous slides for distribution line in open ground or for a partially shielded line by neighboring objects. So, Either you have to calculate N O N S given in the equations. Then over voltages from lightning flashes to objects near the line. Now you see that if you take a say a 150 kilometer line, usually the number of strikes to the line is like one per 100 kilometers, that is one, one flash per 100 kilometers per year. So that's quite small number in, in most of the areas. In some areas, it may be higher in most of the areas where there is average lightning density. However, the number of lightning hitting close to the line may be much higher and these, light, these lightning flashes induce voltages in, in the uh, di distribution line of concern. And most voltages induced on distribution line by flashes that terminate near a lightning, uh, near a, the uh, distribution line, are less than 300 kV. So, can you remember the calc in the calculation also we came across a figure like 330 kV. The induced voltages tend to have short pulse width compared to the time to half value of a typical stroke. So the difference between the lightning generated in a direct stroke and lightning induced in a nearby stroke is that the induced voltages are much shorter in width, it's like 50%. Uh, 
they tend to be unipolar, especially for flashes besides the line. Then when an over voltage level of 300 kV CA4 is considered, it is sufficient for lines in areas of high soil conductivity. An insulation level of 120 kV CA4 may be more appropriate for areas of low soil conductivity. What does that mean? If you are selecting insulators uh, or isolation, then the CF4, a critical impulse flashover voltage, if you consider 300 in most cases, uh, if the soil conductivity is high, don't forget that the word is conductivity, not resistivity. Yeah? We're talking about low resistive soil, then CFO 300 kV is enough. But if you go to high soil resistivity or low conductivity, so high load usually differs at one more or, or one sigma millisiemens per meter, which is which rep represent thousand ohms per meter, or oh, sorry, thousand ohms ohm meters, then you have to go a little higher CFO. Now, earlier we said that soil resistivity does not make a big uh, impact. Yes, it's not a very big impact, but it can be like uh, uh, sometimes 30%. Now, if you, are, uh, if you have, if you can remember what we discussed in the last uh, slide is that uh, usually we uh, assume that the voltage uh, developed in the event of a lightning strike near to the line is in the order of 300 kilovolts. But if you want to do the exact calculation, the equation is what you see here. And uh, uh, so if you look at it, UM is the maximum voltage at the location nearest the ground flash. Uh, the, then V is the speed, the speed of propagation of the lightning current along the channel, which is usually one third of the speed of light. And uh, IP is the current, H is the height of the conductor over ground. So if you look at the equation, you will now understand that higher the uh, height of the tower, greater the induced voltage. And D is the lateral distance from the horizontal line to the vertical lightning stroke. So we assume that lightning is straight, straight vertical. So if the distance is larger, as you may expect, the induced voltage is smaller. Now this diagram shows you what would be the CA4 of our insulators, depending on the ground flash density on the distribution line. So you see that when the, the, the flash, the number of flashes get, uh, uh, the, get uh, increased, uh, the the CF4 value uh, also will increase and the, 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 the three curves are referring to the ground conductivity. And also this will give you the ground resistance with the uh, flashes per 100 kilometers per year. And uh, you can see that when the ground resistance increases, the percentage of direct hits causing flashover also increases. You look at the right hand side. And then we come to underbuilt uh, medium voltage power lines. Uh, if we had a face to face uh, uh, training program, then I would really love to have a discussion at this stage in, in, in what countries you have underbuilt uh, medium voltage power lines. What are underbuilt medium voltage power lines? They are 
the power lines in the same power corridor uh, where there, there are uh, high voltage lines and underneath that there are low voltage lines then uh, the what we have to understand in this case is the distribution lines underbuilt on transmission structures may be especially susceptible to backflash over why greater structure heights and larger right of way will draw more direct flashes to the structure now unlike uh, the distribution lines which are in small power corridors when we have underbuilt line actually the power corridor or right of way is the power corridor uh, should be much larger because it suits the much uh, higher transmission lines and then care must be taken to maintain high insulation levels to avoid unnatural high flash over rates because when we calculate the flash over rate we will get one value but uh, uh, the actual uh, case may be different in addition the voltage stress developed to cause a backflash over is higher on the distribution circuit than on the transmission circuit the simple reason is our uh, insulators are smaller this occurs because the distribution conductors are further from the OHG, the overhead grounding wire, and therefore have a lower coupled voltage, higher voltage across the insulation. The idea is this. Now imagine that a lightning strike uh, the shielding wire, for an example. When the lightning current flows through the shielding wire, there will be an induced voltage in the same phase. Uh, in the other lines as well. But if the two lines are quite close, then the induced voltage is higher. Therefore, when there is an induced voltage in a lower wire, the flashover between the shielding wire where the lightning current actually travels and the other line is less because both have the same phase voltage Maybe the induced voltage is less than the actually generated voltage in the line where the lightning current is traversing, but uh, the voltage difference is less. But if you take a wire much lower down, then the induced voltage in that wire may be much less. So therefore the flashover is a uh, little higher. Therefore the insulation strength on the distribution underbuilt is also usually less than on the transmission circuit. So we know that uh, the, the medium voltage lines have less uh, insulation. The distribution conductors will backflash over first and will then help the transmission circuit's performance by increased coupling to those conductors. So likewise, there are many uh, issues that we come across in underbuilds MV power lines. Underbuilt MV power lines are very cost effective because it will uh, save the, the power company from various uh, infrastructure facilities that you have to develop separately for the medium voltage line if it is in a very different corridor. But at the same time, when it comes to lighting, it has some other problems as well. Then a perfect shielding is achieved when lightning strokes possessing peak current greater than the minimum current causing flashover of insulation are intercepted. What does that mean? Now, whenever a lightning current terminates or a lightning flash terminates in a power line, will you get a problem? Now this is a case where low voltage systems and high voltage or medium voltage systems differ from the with respect to lightning effects. Why do I say that? Now imagine a 3 kilo ampere current lightning flash hits a low voltage line. Uh, say that very close to your home. 
Now, this three kilo ampere current, if there are no lightning protection system at this home, may damage many of your equipment because most of our equipment are not withstandable to such current, although three kilo ampere is not that high as an impulse current. But when it comes to the medium voltage and high voltage systems, anyway, the, these systems are built up to withstand the nominal frequency voltage, which is quite high. So therefore, if a lightning strike, which is having a low current intercept with the, uh, the phase conductor, most probably there is no backflash over or flash over happening at the insulators. And also by the time this current reaches the transformers and so on, uh, their energy is dissipated along the line. So that what we say is, in the event of a shielding wire uh, given in a, a distribution or transmission line, it always interacts with a high probability with high lightning density, high lightning current, uh, lightning flashes. I think if you have attended the low voltage uh, structural protection uh, uh, presentation, you may have understood that when there are step leaders, which gives rise to smaller current comes, they may bypass the lightning protection system. Similarly, they may bypass the shielding wire as well, but they will not make any danger, any damage to the medium or high voltage lines, just like it does in the case of LV lines. Let me show it. Now, uh, with a small animation, consider a step leader that will give rise to a return stroke B current of 30 kilo amperes. Say that 30 kilo amperes is somewhat larger value. Now you see that there is a shielding wire and a face wire there. Now, 30 kilo ampere current a step leader, the step leader which will finally give rise to a 30 kilo ampere return stroke, will bring enough charge to get or, or to give rise to a high electric field strength so that it will attract a streamer from the shielding wire much faster. So before the face wire sends a streamer which will meet the step leader, it will meet the shielding wire. But on the other hand, imagine a three kilo ampere lightning flash is coming. Now what you will see is this. So that it will bypass the streamer from the shielding wire and get attached to the, the lower wire, the face wire. So what I said is that if this happened in the event of a structure, say a house, or a low voltage system, the outcomes may be hazardous, dangerous, because low voltage systems cannot withstand even 3 kilo ampere current. But in the event of medium voltage and especially high voltage, even the higher medium voltage systems, uh, the bypassing of a smaller current uh, lightning flash which will terminate at the face wire is not a big trouble. Okay, now we are going to the, uh, uh, the IEEE standard 1410, which is dealing with the uh, medium voltage uh, protection. Now, how do we uh, get an idea about uh, whether our shielding wire protects us or not. Now consider, uh, let me go to, the, to this slide. Uh, you look at this diagram. There is a shielding wire, ash color, 
red color one is the face wire. Then we define something called the striking distance. Later on, we'll see how this is calculated. So, oh yeah, the calculation is given there. Striking distance is the distance at which the lightning decides to which point that it is going to strike. Now, the striking distance is a function of the lightning current. So when the step reader comes, it has the charge so that the current that it will give rise to the peak current is already determined, already decided. And that current uh, is what decides the striking distance. And usually if the striking distance to ground happens, uh, it is slightly less than uh, the striking distance to the wires because ground is usually flat and not as good conductor as the, the, the wires. Therefore, we give a little less uh, striking distance for the earth. So what does that mean? If a lightning comes to a certain, certain point, then if a wire, a conducting wire and ground are at the same distance, then the, the lightning current will prefer or the step leader prefer going to the conducting wire. And uh, so I hope that you get the idea. Now, we, if you look at the diagram and then see this uh, uh, animation, so if a lightning step leader come to this point, it will be intercepted because it is, you can see that it is in the, uh, the, re, the striking distance to the shielding wire than to the face wire or ground. So that it will most probably end up with the shielding wire. And if a lightning comes there, definitely it will go into the ground because ground is now closer than the two wires. The problem is if a lightning comes within this width W, which is the shielding failure width, as we say, there is a fat chance that the lightning get ended up with the uh, shielding wire. Then just the terminology, uh, depending on where the protective angle uh, and the, the shielding wire is, the overhead shielding wire, uh, we say positive angle or negative angle. Okay, now we are going to the design of a shielding conductor. Following basic design requirements are part and parcel of a successful shielding arrangement. The shielding wire should always have sufficient mechanical strength so as to bear the tensional forces exerted by the towers and environmental agents. So when you are designing a shielding wire, make sure that it has enough length, enough additional length to withstand the stressors uh, due to the motion of the towers, because these towers does not be in one place due to the wind load and so on they may change the position slightly so that the wire get some tension or relaxation. Then displacement distance between the shield wire and phase conductor should always be more than the minimum electrical clearance required. You can understand that because there is always a sagging and this amount of sagging depends on the temperature so that during the uh, winter time, the, the sagging may be less during the summer time sagging may be much higher. So clearance distance should be remain above the minimum safe distance at lower sag points under different environmental temperatures. Now in most of the medium voltage systems, uh, 45 degree angle uh, is used uh, especially if the tower is less than 15 meters uh, uh, 
and the conductor spacing is uh, less than two meters. Taller lines require smaller shielding angles. So this is a rule of thumb that people use. But when we go to high voltage systems, we can't have such rules of thumb. We need to do much uh, precise calculation. And this is how we do the calculation. As I told you earlier, now the collection rate uh, is the equation is the same, but the parameters are a little different. It is now average height of the line and B is the width between outermost uh, conductors. It is more or less the same, but don't forget that in the previous case, it is the length of the, the width of the structure. But now, most often, uh, the, the, when you take the outermost lines, you are getting more than that of the structure. So that you can calculate H again by, because there are various lines now, it's not uh, just the, the length of the tower because uh, some line between the lengths or the heights may be different. And with that calculation, so you calculate capital N, which is the number of strikes to the line. Then by this equation, you can uh, calculate the angle of protection that you have to uh, adapt. And here you see that there are two new parameters, the SFN and K. N is calculated earlier. We have seen that H, simple H also, the equation is there to calculate. Then SFN is called the shielding failure number. That is failures per 100 kilometers per year. This is something that we want. We want means we decide. Uh, SFN has a number from zero to five. If you look at the one before last line, that means zero to five shielding failures per 100 kilometers per year. Now, if you want a very robust, very reliable, a transmission line where you do not need any uh, flashovers or back flashovers, uh, especially the flashovers. Uh, so in other words, you don't need shielding failure at all. Say so that you don't need any shielding failure, zero shielding failure. Now, when you put zero for SFN, you will find that alpha will become quite small because then alpha become 86 into K. We'll go into K later. Uh, K divided by root H. So that uh, you are getting a smaller alpha. What does small alpha means? You need more shielding wires. Okay. But on the other hand, if you if say that you say, okay, two, uh, shielding failures per year is okay for me. Then you put two for SFN, then you will find that your alpha value will be larger than the previous case. So that means you can get a smaller number of shielding wires. Also, you can see that greater the H, smaller the alpha value. So that taller transmission lines need uh, more shielding wires. Hope that you understand. And with this equation, you can easily calculate the uh, protective angle. Then we are going to search uh, or lightning arresters. Uh, let me ask you, even, even I had a discussion with Sri uh, when we decided to, uh, we, we, we discussed to plan this event. Many people get mixed up the surge arrester and lightning arrester terms. Uh, if I ask somebody, what is a lightning arrester? In different parts of the world, lightning arrester means different things. Some people call lightning arrester as a, a copper rod, an air termination. 
and uh, for some people it is different. And surge protective device is in the low voltage systems, we know very well what is a surge protective device. But what is a surge arrester? Now, in most of the European terminology, they have a distinction. A lightning arrester is a, a, an, a lightning protection system usually installed outdoor. For an example, an arcing horn, igla, or whatever the thing, which is installed outside is a lightning arrester. Most often lightning arresters are subjected to direct lightning strikes. Surge arrester is a term used for the surge protectors installed inside, say for an example inside a transformer housing. Then it is called a surge arrester other than that the mechanisms are very similar of both. Okay, then now imagine that we have a load. How do we decide what is the surge protective device we are going to use for this particular case? The theory behind that is what you can see. So imagine that this load is a, it may be a transformer or it may be an insulator. And uh, what we usually do is that if you take the lightning arrester or surge arrester itself, then apply impulse voltages with varying rise time. Then you will see that the breakdown happens across the Say for an example, the lightning arrester, the, depending on the rise time. If the rise time is very small, then the voltage goes to a very, quite a high value before the breakdown occurs. But if the, the, the rise time is less, then the breakdown happens at a later stage. So when you plot the graph, joining the points at which the breakdown happens across either the lightning arrester or the load, we call it the VT characteristic. It's the same for the load. For an example, if you apply impulses over an insulator, then you will find that there will be flashover uh, at a certain point of the waveform and this flashover time increases with increasing rise time. Okay, now when we are selecting surge arresters, we have to compare these VT curves for our load and the arrester. Now you see that the first curve, you have a load VT curve and below that the arrester curve. Now what does this mean? At any uh, voltage, when you apply the impulse current or the impulse voltage, before the voltage reaches the breakdown of the load, it will reach the breakdown of the arrester. Therefore, arrester starts conducting before the load. So then we say that the load is protected. Then if it is in the other way around, then arrester doesn't protect. The that either it's a, it may be a transformer or a load. Uh, the usually we talk in terms of transformers. Uh, it will not. But sometimes you get the curve like that where it is marginal. Uh, before a certain uh, voltage level, the arrester protects the load. Uh, after that, the arrester cannot protect the load. Hope that you understand this. And statistically, you can show it in the same way. If you, if if this curve represents the probability of breakdown with voltage, you can see that. Say, for an example, if you take a surge protector, uh, and then you apply the voltage 
depending on the voltage, the breakdown uh, probability uh, of the surge protector uh, changes. Okay, when the voltage increases, the probability becomes higher and finally it becomes almost 100%. The same thing for a load as well, either a transformer or an insulator. Now we argue it in this way. If you have the probability of arrestors before that of the voltage of the transformer, so that you can see the breakdown of the transformer or the load starts after just after the the probably the hundred percent probability of the arrestor breakdown happens. So now we say that the equipment is well protected. So if you take the fifty percent cases, then you can see that the there is a fifty percent breakdown margin of uh, this much uh, between the arrest and the transformer. But if when it becomes closer and closer and closer, you will get the risk of failure because there is a chance, there is a probability of the load getting broken down or collapsed before the arrest starts uh, the, the conducting. So if the probability of not operating the arrestor is 1 minus PA, PA is the probability of the arrestor being operated. So 1 minus PA is the probability of it is not operating. Then probability of damaging the load is PL. That is the load will be uh, out uh, before the uh, arrestor. Then the risk factor is calculated by 1 minus PA into PL dV, where dV is the voltage. Okay, then I think I don't have time to go to this, the types of arrestors. This is a, this itself is like a, something like a three hour lecture. There are various types of arrestors. Uh, we we basically we call them as the solid state arresters and gap type arresters. Uh, gap type means there is a gap, uh, an arcing gap, uh, which operates through an arc when a transient uh, is uh, uh, present at one end, and. The gap type also, there are two types, the external gaps and internal gaps. The first uh, generation of uh, these gap type arrestors are the arcing horns, which was uh, uh, in use for the last 120 or 100 years. And uh, then the solid state arrestors are usually the metal oxide barrister arrestors. And depending on the voltage level, uh, the arrestor types are different. And uh, it's a whole story, which uh, we have to take uh, one day and discuss about them, uh, what uh, type of arrestors to be used in what applications. For an example, nowadays, this uh, externally gapped Lightning arrestor, so IGLA uh, is becoming very popular for uh, transmission lines over 400 kilo volts. And uh, now another emerging field is the protection of HVDC lines. One question is whether they really need protection, but uh, there are many cases we have seen that uh, HVDC lines uh, getting issues due to lightning. And when it comes to the HVDC line, uh, we have a big issue that usually the positive polarity get much higher number of lightning than uh, the negative polarity. Again, the reason is uh, very simple. So those things we will discuss at another time if we get a chance. Just to show you about uh, 
the importance of having regular SPDs or regular surge arresters in a medium voltage line. The, the now, now if we have a span length of 75 meter between the transmission, the, the distribution lines, say that the uh, we, we have uh, uh, the surge arresters at every 75 meters, uh, then uh, you can see that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the, when you increase the, uh, uh, the, the span length, the number of uh, flashovers increases. So uh, the, the numbers means that two means the distance between two SPDs is 150 meters. Eight means 75 into eight. And when there are no arresters, you get a quite a high uh, rate of flashovers. And that is for the induced voltages. And this is for the direct strikes. For the direct strikes, you will see that uh, very soon you reach the, the ev almost every direct strike uh, getting a flashover. And also when you have a top phase arrestor protecting MV lines, there are some points that you have to be careful about. If the top phase conductor is situa situated such that it will intercept all lightning strokes, arrestors may be applied to the top phase, which make it act like a overhead grounded wire. Then upon being struck, the top phase arrestor will conduct the search to ground. That's what happened. The circuit will be protected if the arrestor ground resistance is low enough and insulation on the unprotected phases is high enough. Like an OHG uh, W, care could be taken to maintain high insulation level on the unprotected phase. So now here the idea is that you can use, uh, this is something done to reduce the cost. You can use the topmost phase wire to protect all other wires. Uh, just instead of having uh, overhead grounding wire, but then there are several points that you have to take care of, uh, like, like the insulation level of uh, that uh, wire and the uh, other grounded objects and so on. Then arrestor lead length consideration. I think Mr. Gopakuma also discussed about that. Just I le will let you know, uh, what really the matter here when when there when there is a large lead length uh, of the the search arrestor and its connection to the lines over to the earth then we get a voltage in uh, generated along those lead lengths as well that will be added to the voltage protection level of the surge arrestor. And finally, what appears across the load is the total addition of the voltage protection level plus the uh, voltage across the lead lens. Therefore, try to minimize the lead lens. Okay, now we are going to the transformers. Okay, if you have a transformer, uh, say a delta connection, the OO, if it is a delta star connection, and this is the primary side. So when you have three uh, search arresters connected to ground, theoretically, it seems that the transients will flow into ground. However, there is a problem. Now, usually you don't get uh, all three phases conducting the same current. Usually what happens is that current will come from one phase. 
and get grounded, then what happens is that uh, due to the impedance, the coupling of uh, the earthing points, if you have separate earthing points, then uh, there will be a potential difference between phases, uh, which may be quite high due to the, the voltage drop across the ground loop. So lightning surges entering a transformer terminal can excite the natural frequency of the transform windings, resulting in high voltage between the phases. Uh, so let me go to the next slide, then I can show it very clearly. So uh, usually what we say is that if you're protecting the delta side of a transformer, better have all the SPDs connected together and grounded uh, at one point. Probably you can use the body or frame of the transformer, but some transformer manufacturers do not like the idea. This is also another point that we can discuss at another time. Okay. Uh, now, Lightning surges enter. Uh, we will go to the second point for transformers with delta connected low voltage winding arresters. Between phase may be also necessary on the low voltage side to limit inductive transferring voltage. Now the thing is this, as I showed you earlier. Now imagine that this is. Uh, delta, the delta side are not showing. The neutral is grounded. This may be the last substation from where we get uh, power into our houses. Here, the problem is that if you protect only the faces, there may be, uh, now even if you connect the earthing together, due to the voltage across the coils, you can get a voltage difference between the phases. So sometimes uh, the manufacturers of transformers recommend having uh, as, uh, the surge arresters uh, across the, the lines as well, the phases as well. And uh, if it is a neutral insulated transformer, uh, the uh, 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 delta star or star delta, then we can connect them like this or like that. And usually the second one is better because it has less number of transformers, uh, the less number of surge arresters. And then I don't know how, how much time that I have. Uh, Shree, how much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes more. Okay, I think I'm now coming to the last stage. Okay, now uh, let me take a transformer. And uh, so if you look at the diagram here and the transformer, uh, the real transformer, you can identify the components. Say that we get the line from the bushing and through an SPD, it is grounded separately, uh, not connecting it to the body. If we connect it like that, can you understand if SPD is separately grounded, you the voltage that will uh, appear across the transformer winding is the voltage across the length L1, let me call it V1, then the UP value of the search uh, uh, arrester plus the voltage across the length L2, let me say V2. And uh, if SPD is grounded through the transformer body, the search arrester, then uh, V2 could be significantly reduced. But again, uh, 
Sometimes the transformer manufacturers, due to some reasons, do not like this idea. Okay, now let me come into the previous slide. There is something that uh, you have noticed. In a uh, neutral grounded transformer, uh, are we going to connect the neutral earth and the uh, body and surge protective earth? You can see that here also the body and surge protective earth are joined together. Uh, now the thing is that uh, we have to decide whether we are going to connect them together the neutral earth and the other earth in connections or keeping them separately. Now, this is a point where we have a lot of controversies. And uh, one of the best uh, standards where you find this problem resolved, not giving very good uh, reasoning, but giving some good guidelines uh, is the Australian standard on uh, substation thing. Uh, and in the next few slides, I will show you some recommendations from the Australian standards. Now, now, this is again, I would love to have a discussion with all of you if we have a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, training program. What is the purpose that we have to keep the two earths, the neutral earth and the lightning protection and body earth uh, far apart. There are several reasons. One reason is that uh, if you take a TNS, TNC or TNCS low voltage wiring systems, then uh, you get uh, the neutral wire going into the, the, the subscriber or the uh, power seeker and then either that neutral wire or a separate earthing wire going from the same neutral uh, earth point will act as your protective earth. So in the event that you connect them together, uh, one issue is that uh, if there is a lightning, there are a lot of chances that lightning hitting the uh, the second, uh, the primary of the transformer, and that uh, lightning voltage, the, when the lightning current passes through the earthing system, there will be a certain voltage rise. When you connect them, this voltage will transfer into the neutral point and that voltage will appear all the way uh, up to the uh, subscriber's level and appear at the neutral or earthing point of all those places, which is not that favorable. And on the other hand, Usually, due to the unbalancing of the loads, there can be a sizable neutral current flowing into the earth. And uh, due to that, there can be a fairly large sustained over voltage appearing uh, at the uh, neutral earth. When we connect the two, the transformer body will be lifted to that neutral voltage. And that may be harmful to the workers who are going to workers, not only workers. Now, in countries like uh, South Asia, we see that there are transformers. For an example, the transformer in this picture, most probably somebody can touch the cross iron bars of this transformer, it, it may be just uh, one and a half meters above ground level. And uh, 
now imagine that uh, the neutral voltage is transferred to the body and so that it is, it is in turn now transferred to this uh, cross iron bars so if somebody touches that he may definitely be killed and we 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 come across many records many reports that uh, uh, such accidents happen in the south asian region maybe not very different in africa and latin america as well uh, and also in the event of a uh, heavy rain the situation will be even worse so therefore we say that these earthing systems should be kept uh, far apart but there are cases the integration of these two earthing systems are allowed so they are called common multiple earth neutral cement system uh, where you have a separate uh, wire going to neutral uh, star point uh, surge arresters any conductive surfaces and so on then hv equipment tank hv surge arresters and all those things so all are joined together so it's a single common earth in order to follow this uh, arrangement according to the australian standards you have to fulfill many conditions first thing is a very low resistance to earth for the neutral is required uh, cement to ensure hv fault currents do not cause unacceptably high voltages on the lv network hope that you understand it conditions required for creating a, a common uh, earthing system are how low the australian standards say less than 1 ohm resistance between the network neutral and earth that means the earth resistance of the uh, earthing network should be less than 1 and a minimum of 3 transformers with lv neutral incorporated so they say that for one transform system you can't do that there should be at least 3 transformers connected together again they are trying to ensure that the current will be distributed if there were only a few earth rods although achieving less than one norm to earth at the time of testing problems may arise later due to resistance increasing with seasonal soil moisture variation that's why they expect at least three transformers having separate earths but joined together then the last number of electrodes required for formation of cement system based on the Australian standards. You, you know that in most places, achieving less than one ohm resistance is quite a task, quite a task. Then there is also additional general requirement that individual earth resistance disconnected from the network must be less than 30 ohm for pole mounted plant and less than 10 ohms for ground mounted plants. So that means, say that you have five earth pits uh, where each earth pit has an earth rod or earth conductor which we connect together to form our earthing system. What they say is that each of these pits should have less than 30 ohm. Altogether, they will be less than 1 ohm. But each one at least 30 ohm if it is pole mounted so that the transform is higher up. 10 ohms if it is ground mounted. The simple reason is that if it is ground mounted, the chances of somebody touching it is higher. In high load density areas, conditions generally allow see, uh, the common uh, earthing network systems because uh, high high load density areas has many transformers so that you can uh, use uh, the cement they have their own advantage only one earthing system need be installed at distribution transformers 
you don't need two uh, earthing systems, one for the neutral and one for the body and lightning protection system. The step and touch potential problems are reduced because it is one whole earth mat. Earth potential rise problems associated with electrical plant in close proximity to the electro, uh, electrocommunication uh, plant are also reduced, that is noise is reduced, then earth fault currents are higher because now the very low earth resistance, therefore in the event of an earth fault, the earth fault current is higher, that means the, the, the tripping devices work perfectly. And uh, then typically separated earthing system. And what they say is that if you are separating earth systems, this is the case in most of the uh, countries uh, where it is very difficult to achieve that one known resistance. And don't forget that although Australian standards allow this integration of the earthing systems, in some countries it is not allowed. And what they say is that there should be at least a four meter minimum distance between the neutral earth and the, uh, the, the earth of the other systems, the uh, lightning protection body earth and so on. So in cases where cement conditions are cannot be met, uh, the two earthing systems should be separated. And also a very important thing is that uh, the, the conditions are somewhat similar in the case of cement. Here you have to insulate the earthing leads up to the earth pit so that you make sure that uh, in between the earth pits, the earth potential will not be transformed transferred from the conductors to the ground. So I skip all these discussions. Uh, so the, what I said, which is very important is at the last. Uh, and this is uh, for a pole mounted uh, transformer. You can see that uh, the earthing systems are separated at least by uh, 4,000 millimeters or 4 meters. That is the minimum. And nowadays we are trying to see whether we can Im implement a potential barrier in between these using titanium oxide and various other things, but these are at the research level. And this is for an underground network, the same. Okay, finally, um, I, I don't have much time to go into the details of this. One of the biggest headaches of, of power company people is to get low earth resistance at tower sites. Uh, there are various reasons for that. If the tower is on a flat land, uh, say close to a paddy field, then most often you can very easily achieve a low earth resistance. However, in most cases, in pathological cases, the, the towers, especially the towers on the mountain terrains, they have ultra high soil resistivity. Some are on the rock, no soil at all. Then footing at different levels. This is the biggest problem that I come across when uh, uh, giving solutions for uh, earthing issues. Then acute slopes, a couple of meters away from some footing. So that for an example, in this particular tower in Malaysia, uh, just after the, uh, the tower to the left, uh, there is a 50, 60 meter uh, slope so that you don't know where to get the uh, earthing conductors. Then soil instability, that's another problem. You can't dig uh, trenches to bury your uh, conductors because the soil will get uh, moved out. 
And another problem, some of you from Malaysia can uh, recognize these two gentlemen, Ms. Professor Zainal Qadir, other one is uh, Mr. Muzamil, our electrical engineer at uh, with uh, the UPM. Uh, there are many cases where a movement of heavy machinery such as backhoes is almost impossible to be taken. This is another issue. Most often you have to dig the trenches by hand or by uh, hand carried equipment, not by heavy machinery. So these are the issues that come across uh, in these towers. But how to give solutions to these, these cases, uh, these pathological cases, is an art of uh, uh, engineering. So one solution that you give to one case may not be able to apply to another tower. So for that, you need to give a state of state of the art solution looking at the tower so that uh, one advice i can give you if you are a tower constructor uh, the the earthing providers to uh, transmission towers never give a quotation without having a good inspection you visit the site have a very good inspection measure the soil resistivity at various places and make a very, very careful estimation of the cost that will incur, not for the earthing material alone, but for the labor and uh, installation cost. And most often, the, the transportation, labor, and uh, uh, installation cost is at least 50% higher than the material uh, used for the earthing. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, 